Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's NDSR, NDSR Art Enrichment Session, Getting Started with Disk Imaging, featuring Ben Fino Radin, the founder and lead conservator of Small Data Industries. My name is Rachel Ward, and I'm this year's NDSR Art Resident at Small Data Industries. Today's webinar is part of a series of professional development opportunities created by NDSR Art. NDSR Art is a partnership of the Philadelphia Museum of Art and Arles NA, made possible with generous funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Before we get started, I'll mention a few things to keep in mind. Please note this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to Arles's open access learning portal. Secondly, please feel welcome to type in your questions at any time during the presentation. You can do so using the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel. I will be noting your questions throughout the session and will present them to Ben following the presentation. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Ben Fino Radin, the lead conservator and founder of Small Data Industries, whose mission is to support and empower people to safeguard the permanence and integrity of the world's artistic record. Before founding Small Data, Ben was the associate media conservator at the MoMA and the digital conservator at Rhizome. He holds an MFA in digital art and a second master's degree in library and information sciences. He has also served as an adjunct at NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program. So now I'll pass it over to, to Ben to begin his presentation. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thank you so much to NDSR Art for the invitation and to Rachel for organizing this webinar. Um, super excited to see it so well attended. Um, so before we get things started, I do want to reiterate this is getting started with disk imaging. So if you're, if you're somebody who's already doing a lot of disk imaging, um, you might find portions of this a little boring, but it'll be some solid review. Um, so this is very much a, a 101 type session. So as Rachel mentioned, uh, I'm the founder and lead conservator of Small Data Industries. Um, we are a lab based here in New York, and our mission is to support and empower people who ensure the permanence and integrity of the world's artistic record. Uh, and so we fulfill this mission uh, through two fundamental areas, through consulting and services. So our consulting often looks like strategic planning with institutions, managing organizational change for institutions that are seeking to build their own in-house expertise for the conservation of time-based media art or digital preservation, generally speaking. Um, and this often extends to technical infrastructure. And then on the services end of the business, that's where um, you know it's people just hiring us to do the thing, be it art conservation, stabilizing obsolete born digital media, or um, the assessment and processing of entire artists' archives. So with that quick intro out of the way, um, what will we be covering today? Um, just to quickly review, we will go over first, what is a disk image, why we make disk images, um, comparing disk imaging to something you might be familiar with called Bagot, uh, and we'll get into what that even is later if you're not familiar with it, so don't worry. Uh, we're gonna have a, a brief demo of um, one of the numerous ways that you can make disk images. Uh, and then we'll conclude with some review of kind of further considerations that are very important to think about before you get started with any kind of um, systematic disk imaging, be it um, as an institution or a consultant. So first, for some context, uh, of course, Many of the attendees here um, already know this, and that is you can simply not rely long-term on the original media provided at the time of acquisition when you are an institution collecting media, be that for archives or art. And unfortunately, there is no form of permanent or archival digital storage. It just simply does not exist. Um, you may have heard of some cool things about like DNA storage or um, embedding bits and bytes into holographic glass. Um, there's some super exciting stuff that's gone on in that space in terms of thinking about a form of storage that could last forever. But at least for today, it doesn't really exist. Uh, so fact number two, getting artworks off their original media carriers or archives off their original media carriers and into a managed digital preservation environment truly is the only way to ensure the longevity of your collection. Um, and just to throw some 
quick stats at you. Um, if you've ever seen us present at um, the American Institute for Conservation or at the Library of Congress's storage architectures meeting, you would have already seen these stats. Um, but we surveyed numerous art world stakeholders, um, institutions, artists, galleries, collectors, nonprofits um, to understand um, where they are at when it comes to establishing digital preservation storage. Um, and this is a, a very high level sample of those results. So as you can see, um, most people truly in the art world are just getting started. Um, and if we isolate the sample set to just the institutions, it actually um, it doesn't look any better. In fact, it looks worse. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. So where do we begin? So of course, the first step when considering digital preservation is just getting all of these things off these unstable carriers and into one centrally managed location where good policy procedure and best practices are followed. And step two is securing that, ensuring that access is not unlimited and unfettered, that only people who have certain you know, specific clearance levels do have access to that central location. And then creating redundancy. Um, obviously, if we store everything in one location, that's not very good. Um, you know, as they say, lots of copies keep stuff safe. So we need at least three copies in three locations. Four would be phenomenal. Um, but in practice, many of you likely know that it's challenging even to achieve two for some institutions or archives or collections. Beyond redundancy, the next step is establishing fixity, the, ab the, the ability to ensure that a given file has not changed either due to corruption or um, accidental deletion or renaming or moving or malicious actions. The final step, of course, is reassessment um, because no digital storage environment is um, permanent. Nothing lasts forever. Infrastructure needs to be refreshed and replaced. Procedures need to be reassessed on a regular basis. So reassessment is a critical, critical step. But we are really here today to talk about this step, centralization, getting things off their unstable carriers and into a centrally managed environment. And disk imaging is just one way to go about doing this first step. So before you begin disk imaging, the first thing you really need to think about is this sort of pre-ingest workstation. Um, and we're going to kind of dive a bit into what this looks like. This is essentially saying that you have a dedicated computer at your institution or in your lab um, where this is where all archives or artworks that are coming in get processed through. Um, and having that dedicated to one workstation is ideal because you can make sure that all the software you need is pre-installed, any access controls um, or limitations. Um, you may even consider collaborating with your IT department to sort of uh, create an air gap, which means that the machine is on the network, but it, it, it's sort of protected from potentially infecting um, any other computers or machines on the network. Um, because if you are collecting um, you know, heterogeneous born digital material, uh, virus is a risk, of course. So establishing this pre ingest workstation is the first step. And on this pre ingest workstation, there's a really critical thing that happens and this is a really fundamental concept that is going to be important not just um, as we dive into exploring what a disk image is and how they work um, and forensic disk images but also when we uh, talk about Bagot and again basic concept so this will be review for some of you um, and that's the concept of a checksum so we've already talked about the concept of fixity and that's our ability to ensure that a file has not changed so the way we do this is um, commonly by creating what is called a hash or a checksum. So we do this by taking here our video file, running this through a program, a checksum program, and that program outputs a very long string of letters and numbers that is completely 100% unique to that given file that we've run through the program. So the reason that's helpful is because if we run that program run that file through that program again in 50 years, in theory, it should produce the exact same result. And so this is a bit of a simple oversimplification. Um, we're saying it's a checksum program, but really when you get under the hood, um, it's really a, a specific checksum algorithm that is creating the result. So it's not uh, specific to any given piece of software. So it's kind of uh, software 
agnostic, so to speak. Um, and there are different kinds of checksum algorithms. So um, MD5 is um, kind of the fastest to run. It's the shortest, but it's also the least secure from a security standpoint. Um, there have been computer scientists that uh, in a research environment have been able to uh, take a file, create a checksum of that file, and then with only the checksum of that file, create a new totally different file that matches that checksum. Um, so we don't need to worry about this in all settings. Um, digital preservation is often about kind of different levels of paranoia <laughs> and understanding what's appropriate for your given setting. Um, but it's just important to note that MD5 is generally considered um, a reverse engineered, not secure checksum. Um, SHA-256 and SHA-512 are fundamentally different algorithms and they are just increasing levels of um, length of the checksum and therefore uh, security of the checksum. So returning to this concept of a pre-ingest workstation where this checksum gets calculated and where we establish our fixity and sort of chain of custody of the files that we're acquiring uh, in the archive or in the art institution, um, you have three really important things. Um, first, obviously a computer, <laughs> of course, can't do anything without that. Um, a write blocker, um, which is a device that we essentially plug the hard drive or thumb drive that we are taking the files off of. Um, we plug the hard drive or thumb drive into this write blocker device instead of plugging it into the computer. And the write blocker is then connected to the computer. And it's essentially sort of like wearing gloves when you handle an object. It prevents uh, your computer from accidentally writing new data to the archival uh, media that you are handling. Um, you also can't accidentally you know, delete things or rename things or move things around. So it's just a general best practice. Um, having some kind of local storage um, that is big and that is fast attached to your pre ingest workstation is also important because um, in most settings, you generally uh, may not be uploading this material directly to your centralized storage. It might be sitting on this pre ingest workstation for a period of sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes even months, um, and that can add up. So having enough room for all of that is very important. Um, and we also want fast storage so that this doesn't take too much time. So uh, local RAID uh, just refers to one particular way of solving that problem, and that is a RAID, which is a redundant array of inexpensive disks. Um, I'm sure you've all seen or used one of these in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, it's if you've ever had some kind of external hard drive device where there's more than one hard drive, that's a RAID. So those are the three fundamental concepts. So now I'm going to show you um, some practical examples of what this might look like. Um, so here in our lab, we have kind of two different versions of this. Um, first is uh, this workstation. And this workstation is kind of, I would say, like our more um, souped up version with all the bells and the whistles. Um, so uh, on the right side of the image, we have the actual computer. Uh, this is a custom built PC, um, nothing terribly fancy. Um, it's just a pretty standard custom PC build. Um, but it has um, the write blockers that we were referring to previously built into the front of the computer. So everything is all integrated. It also includes um, various other drives and media types, such as uh, five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch floppy disks. Uh, to the uh, continuing on to the left of the image um, from the right, we have a uninterruptible power supply. So if the power goes out for two minutes or something like that, it doesn't interrupt the process. Um, and then we have a uh, copy stand uh, photo setup. So this is where all media is photographed um, front, back, and side uh, with a color target. Uh, so in addition to the disk image, we produce actual photographs of the original media. So if um, somebody is working in an environment in the future where they only have the disk image and they don't have the physical object, they still have, you know, uh, reference for what it looks like. And then just, you know, the actual 
screen there on the left where the user sits and works with the workstation. So again, like I said, this is kind of maybe it's nothing terribly fancy. It's not extremely expensive, but this is kind of um, the higher end version of what you could have. Um, and just a close up shot here of the hard drive that we're looking at there with the color target. So an alternative alternative to this is that you could instead uh, rely on write blockers that are all external or portable. And these are definitely very, very useful and desirable for many reasons. A, it, um, it can, you can definitely set up a dedicated pre ingest workstation using these external write blockers in a way that would be much more affordable than building a custom PC or buying um, a uh, digital forensics workstation that has all of these built into it off the shelf. Those generally will be much more expensive. Um, and so these are just a few examples. Um, the write blocker in the middle is for SATA and IDE hard drives, which are just internal hard drives that would come out of a computer typically. Um, and that we have one that reads all kinds of memory cards, USB 3.0 and USB 2.0. And these enclosures, these little uh, silver boxes you see on the left-hand side are um, actually enclosures for proprietary Apple solid state drives. And we use these in conjunction with the USB 3.0 write blocker. So if this is the approach that you're taking, your pre ingest workstation might look a lot more like this. Uh, very, very simple, very affordable PC, uh, um, or you could certainly use a Mac computer. Um, although I should say that um, the demo portion of today is going to definitely place an emphasis on a PC environment. Um, so just a very simple computer and write blockers. Um, it, you might be familiar with something called uh, FRED, which is a it's an acronym that stands for uh, Forensic Recovery of Evidence Device, and it's a very particular product made by um, uh, Digital Intelligence, a company that makes um, write blockers. And these are very expensive, and generally speaking, they are overkill um, for most environments because they're built for doing very intensive um, analysis on large amounts of data. Whereas if all you're trying to do is create disk images, um, all you need is a very, very basic computer. So um, that's why we have these two very different kinds of setups here in our lab. We have one that's more for analysis and one that's more for simply just producing reliable disk images. Um, and just for a sense of cost, um, last time we checked, this is just you know what some of these external write blockers retail for. Um, generally speaking, um, we've had very good luck both with Tableau brand right blockers, but also Webitech. Um, there's, you know, we have no particular brand allegiance whatsoever. Um, you know, if it works, it, it works. <laughs> it only has one job to do, and that's right protection. So what is a disk image? Now, if we think about a setting like this, where an artist gives us a box of hard drives, and this is their archive, um, our job, of course, um, as stewards of cultural heritage, is to ensure that this box, like sort of as we see it, um, can be preserved with context and with authenticity. So this is where disk images, um, and forensic disk images in particular, come in very handy. Um, so to illustrate what a disk image is, uh, we have this little diagram. So let's let's say we have this uh, aging PC over here, or uh, actually I think that's supposed to be a Mac. Um, so we would connect that to our pre-ingest workstation through our write blocker, and we would create a disk image. So the disk image, as this graphic illustrates here, is essentially one single file, it's one single document that contains a complete snapshot of that entire computer environment. Um, now, if there's anybody particularly technical who does a lot of disk imaging on the call, that you might know that's kind of <laughs> technically inaccurate in the sense that um, a disk image doesn't capture the entire computer in the sense that um, it doesn't capture the CPU or the RAM or anything like that, but um, the hard drive of a computer does contain the entire 
operating system. So this disk image, this one file that we create as a result of this process contains all of that. It would contain the operating system, the user's files, everything exactly as they left it. Um, and this string of letters and numbers here is to indicate the fact that um, a checksum is created at this point in time. Um, so we have a complete snapshot of this uh, artist's computer and we have a piece of metadata that will let us know if this file is authentic in the future. So um, with all of that set up and that, that background, we'll now dive into the demo portion. So we'll show you how this is actually done. Um, we are going to be reviewing one particular um, workflow, and that is how to use um, the Forensics Toolkit, FTK Imager, uh, for Windows. So this is a free program. Um, it is proprietary software, but it's free and um, has a relatively user-friendly uh, user interface. So um, this is what we will be focusing on for the demo portion. And should start any second now. I'm going to be narrating on top of, uh, we're not doing a live demo as we know those can be unreliable. Here we go, okay. So first um, we are looking at the kind of my computer section of the PC and we have this thumb drive. It has some files on it. We have JPEGs, some pictures of clouds. Uh, it looks like we have a text file. It's a readme file. There's a folder inside of that. We have some more images. There are some subfolders inside of there with some executable files. So just reviewing the contents of this thumb drive. So we'll now launch FTK Imager and we add an evidence item. In this case, we want to add a logical drive because the drive in particular that we are working with is a USB drive. And these always show up under the logical drives. And as we can see here, we have Samsung USB, and I just happen to know that the drive in particular that we're using is Samsung brand, so that's a safe bet that that's the right one. After we add it, the drive shows up here in our evidence tree, as we can see that this pane is named. So in this panel, we get a great kind of a uh, tree diagram of a very, very low level view of the hard drive. So we see um, at the very first node here, the E slash, this is representative of the physical device itself. The next thing that uh, the software is showing us is that there is a file system contained on this physical device called Samsung USB, and it is in the FAT32 file system. Uh, and we'll circle back to uh, explaining what file systems are. So as we expand these nodes in this pane, we begin to see files and folders. So it's important to note that when you're using this software, um, on the left-hand side, you only see folders, but not files. So your files will show up in this file list pane here. So we can kind of click around on these. And in the bottom right-hand pane, we actually get a preview of the file if it's something that FTK Imager is able to actually render natively. So we can see here we have a PDF uh, in addition to some of those um, JPEGs. And you might notice here, there's a funny file with an X through it and it says secret plan. Uh, so this is in fact a deleted file. So this is a very, very important thing to note. If you're new to disk imaging, uh, when we create disk images, um, Generally speaking, by default, files that have been deleted by the artist or donor or who, whoever it is, whatever the context is that we're talking about, those deleted files will be captured as a result of this process. So that's a very important thing to note because that has implications in terms of policy and procedure. So here we can click on that and because it's plain text, we can see this quote unquote secret plan being <laughs> revealed here. Um, so that's a, a glimpse at um, how you can navigate this interface. So to actually create the disk image, we're just gonna right click here in our evidence tree on the uh, first node in our kind of tree diagram. 
And when we do that, we're going to say export disk image. And when we do that, uh, we have to first add an image destination. We need to tell it where we want to put it on our computer or what physical storage or digital storage we want to put it on. And oops, oh boy, I accidentally advanced the slide. So let's jump back here. Okay. So um, at this point, we have a very important decision to make. The software is asking us the destination image type. So there are many different kinds of formats, file formats that we can use for disk images. Um, we will delve a bit deeper into these different formats and why you might choose one over the other um, at the conclusion of the demo. But it's important to note that here, this is the point in the workflow where you would be making that choice. Um, so the first choice is raw, the next is smart, the next EO1, and the final is AFF, the advanced forensic format. And um, again, when we uh, conclude the, the demo, we'll delve a bit into what these different formats get, may or may not get you. But for now, we are going to select EO1 and, oh, I advanced the slide again. This is, I'm just gonna stop clicking. I'm only causing problems. <laughs> so uh, the reason we have chosen EO1, um, there have been numerous very, very rigorous uh, white papers and case studies written on uh, analysis and comparison of the various uh, forensic disk image formats. And unilaterally, universally, um, EO1 has consistently um, been the one that is recommended. Um, it's relatively complex to explain in this context, um, but there, there was a phenomenal JISC case study written years ago um, on this topic. Um, Harvard also commissioned a white paper on the topic, um, but suffice it to say that if uh, you have made the decision to create forensic disk images, uh, EO1 is generally the recommended format. So at this point, we have the opportunity to enter in metadata that will be actually embedded within our disk image. So this is one of the reasons that forensic disk images are quite desirable. Um, so it's important to note that um, the fields for this metadata uh, were very much um, derived from the world of criminal forensics and law enforcement. And because that is who typically uses F FTK Imager, um, that is what they are in this software. Um, at the conclusion of the demo, we're going to share um, a piece of software with you that actually doesn't use these terms from law enforcement, um, but instead uses terms that are more uh, adapted for an archival setting or a cultural heritage setting. Um, but what's mostly important here is that, uh, of course, one develops uh, consistency in how these fields are being adapted within your setting. So in this, this case, as you can see, we're using case number for some kind of a session number, evidence number, perhaps for a sub number, like a component number, unique description. We have chosen to put the name of the drive. Examiner is the name of the person making the disk image. And in notes, in the notes field, in this case, we've made the choice to describe what kind of write blocker we were using in this case. But this is, of course, um, very much up to you and your institution, what you put here. Next, we just need to tell FTK Imager where we want to actually put the disk image. So I'm just going to navigate here to our storage drive and say OK. Uh, we now need to name the disk image, um, excluding the extension, which will be added automatically. We're just giving it some basic name. And here we have the option of quote unquote fragmenting our image. So if we did not set this option to zero, instead of having one file for our disk image, as we were describing previously, we would actually wind up with many, many very little files. Um, there are certain use cases where that is useful, but generally speaking, it's not necessary. So in our case, we are going to prefer to just have one very large file. Um, so we are going to set that option to zero so that it is sure to be one complete file instead of many little ones. Uh, we uh, next 
just want to review a few funnel details. We want to verify the image after it's created. We want to pre-calculate progress statistics and create a file listing when we are done. So now with the uh, magic of the webinar, time will pass rather quickly here. But as you can see, the um, estimated time left starts very low. And 45 minutes later, even though the initial ETA was seven minutes, we have a complete disk image. So in this case, this was um, roughly a 25 gigabyte uh, thumb drive and it took 45 minutes to disk image. Um, this was using a Weebitech uh, USB 3.0 write blocker. Um, and as you can see here, we are now doing the verification step. So this is a step where, again, because the disk image has a checksum embedded in it, we can also use that to make sure that we uh, essentially got a good read of the hard drive when we were creating that disk image. So um, the checksum of the hard drive as it was read was stored in memory. And what's happening now is that FTK Imager is calculating a checksum of the disk image and it's going to compare those two so that we can be sure we got a good read of the hard drive. Of course, if we create the disk image but it was uh, maybe failing physically and didn't get a good read, that's not very helpful to us. So um, this uh, verification doesn't take nearly as long as you can see. Uh, in the elapsed time, um, it took um, just around, I think a minute and a half. And once that's complete, we get this uh, results pane that shows us that uh, MD5 and SHA-1 checksums were calculated and verified for the disk image and the hard drive and that no bad sectors were found, which is phenomenal. That is exactly what we want to see. So we'll then close out of this window and we have to close out of the verification uh, progress window as well as the disk imaging progress window. And so now we have our EO1 disk image, a CSV file, and a text file. So the text file is a log that contains the metadata. Uh, this metadata is also embedded within the disk image itself. Uh, and it, the, the log file also contains just information about the process, um, how long it took, the checksums that were calculated, uh, what software was used, and so on. So it's not structured metadata, um, but it is a useful log file. So now the CSV that we asked it to create, this contains a listing of every single individual file that was on that drive. So these files, if they can, uh, these CSV files, if the drive contained a lot of files can be very, very large. Um, you know, if you have thousands of files, it will be thousands of rows long. And as a reminder, deleted files will be included. Um, this CSV handily indicates if a file is in fact deleted or not. Um, and as you can see here, there's also very, very low level detailed technical information captured in this process. Um, there are file nodes that um, are part of unallocated space on the drive that are also listed here, but um, it's clearly identified as being part of that unallocated space on the drive. So these are not files that we really care about for um, our context. So, what do we do once we have these disk images? Um, let's say we wanted to actually mount one of these disk images so we could access the files in it. So we're showing here that we have not connected the USB thumb drive. So back in FTK Imager, we will click image mounting. We will select our disk image file, click open. And then before clicking mount, we just want to double check that here we have read only selected. So this is great because this means that without a write blocker, we just click mount and then we will return to my computer and we can see it's as though we have that physical device plugged in. Everything's there just as we left it, but uh, we don't have the thumb drive plugged in right now. What you're seeing is just the disk image. So uh, it's a handy way to have read only access to the files exactly as they were left um, with all metadata and file naming conventions totally intact.
And to unmount it, we just select these here and click Unmount. So that's fine, but what if uh, somebody needs easier access? They just want access to the individual files. Well, we could just, in FTK Imager, select individual files from this file pane, right click and click Export Files. And then we get the option of, oh, and it looks like we have an error in our video here and we don't have focus on the correct thing. So let's just, ah, so we just missed the naming of the folder we were putting them in, but you can see it has successfully exported those files as, as it says, and here they are. So it's very, very simple. It's very rudimentary, but it's just one easy way to export files from the disk image itself. So now we talked a bit about fixity and that's where we check that checksum to ensure authenticity, that something hasn't been changed, that it hasn't been deleted. So how do we do that with disk images? We can add an evidence item here in FTK Imager and we will select this time an image file we will load in our disk image, click open and finish. And now if we, just expanding to show that it's identical, it's the same, we can right click and choose verify drive slash image. So when we do this, it's going to recalculate those checksums that it created originally um, and compare the result of that checksum process to the original process. And in this case, we have success. So we can see that the computed MD5 and SHA-1 checksums do in fact, in fact match the originals. So we've been talking about disk imaging so far. Um, now, just to briefly re review and show you an alternative, we wanted to show you um, the Bagot format and Bagger. Um, as an alternative, um, you know, there are some settings, many settings in fact, where creating a perfect and complete snapshot of a hard drive or a thumb drive is overkill. Um, you still want fixity. You still want the ability to demonstrate authenticity, um, but perhaps preserving deleted files in original order isn't necessarily a concern. So this might be a setting where using uh, Bagger and the Bagot format is more appropriate, um, but there are very significant uh, trade-offs to this approach, which we will review um, when we conclude the demo. So this is the Bagger interface. Um, now it is very important to note that um, although uh, this software does still work, um, it functions perfectly fine. Um, it is no longer supported by the Library of Congress uh, who originally created it. So it's a perfectly fine piece of software for now, um, but there certainly will come a day in the future when it is perhaps um, obsolete and may not be a, a, a viable uh, option. But for now, uh, it works just fine. So uh, we will say that we want to create a new bag and here we have the option of selecting what's called a profile. So a profile when you're creating a bag um, is essentially the ability to have predefined <sighs> metadata fields that you want to embed within your bag. Um, in our case, we don't have any profile um, that we are going to select. Um, so we're just going to say no profile and okay. Next, we want to add things to our bag. So we're going to click the little plus button here and we are going to navigate to our Samsung USB thumb drive. And in this case, we're just gonna select a couple of JPEGs and say open. And once we've done that, um, here, if we did want to enter in some metadata, metadata manually that's not part of a specific profile, we could pick any number of these predefined fields here that the software provides to you. Uh, in our case, we're going to say external description uh, and just type something in here just to give you uh, an example of what it might look like. Uh, once we've done this, we can uh, either create a bag in place or save our bag. Um, creating a bag in place 
doesn't make sense in this particular instance because we are trying to take something off a thumb drive and put it into our storage. Um, if we had files that were already in storage but they were not in a bag, uh, we would do a bag in place. So in this case, we are going to do a save bag as, and we just need to tell bagger where we want to save this bag. So we're just going to do that put it on our desktop and give it a name. And we are gonna leave all of these options as default, except for which checksum algorithm we want to use. And we're going to click OK. And we uh, are just pointing out here that you could create your bag as a zip file, as opposed to just a uh, folder. Um, but in our case, we are not going to do that. So we're just leaving that as none. The bag is saved very, very quickly. And we are now going to show you the contents of that. So this is what a bag looks like, actually. It's just a folder with a series of text files and a subfolder called data. So the manifest, uh, so here we're just going to show you the contents of the data folder, contains those images we chose to move over. The manifest just contains a listing of the contents of the data folder and the corresponding checksums that we asked to calculate for those. The tag manifest is similar, but it's actually checksums for the log files and the manifest files. Uh, the bag uh, bagit.txt file, again, bit of a log file, and the bag info contains the metadata that we chose to enter. Um, so if we wanted to check fixity with the bag, this is how we would do that. Again, using the bagger software, we just say that we want to open an existing bag. And then all we have to do is click validate bag. And when it does that, it's going to do uh, three things. As you can see down here, uh, towards the bottom middle of the screen, we have three green check marks, complete, valid, and profile compliant. That means that everything that is supposed to be in the bag is in the bag, um, that the checksums for the files still match the original value. So that means the files are authentic. And profile compliant, meaning that any metadata that was supposed to be there is there. So these are three very good checks. Um, there's certainly um, some benefits to the Bagot format. And that concludes the demo portion. So as promised, um, really quickly, uh, so this is a screenshot of an alternative to the FTK Imager software that we showed to you. Um, this is uh, Gimager, and this is a program uh, that is only compatible with Linux for now, um, but it is free and open source software, and um, in a great example of what makes free and open source software phenomenal is um, uh, some archivists on Twitter were talking about how it's unfortunate that um, you know the tools that we have available to us for forensic disk imaging use this terminology from law enforcement as opposed to um, archival terms. Um, and so uh, the creator of Gimager modified the software to in fact um, have different terms instead of evidence number and examiner and and so on. Um, so this is just uh, an example of that. So let's um, talk finally about um, why this is a great example of why you would use disk images instead of the Bagot format um, when appropriate. So with Bagot, you do yes get verifiable file level checksums, um, but uh, you know, you also do, of course, get this with a forensic disk image. Um, and something that we're not going to review in detail here is um, DFXML, uh, but it is important um, for further reading for you all after this kind of introductory session. Um, so DFXML is Digital Forensics XML. Um, so there essentially, uh, there are some more advanced tools that you can use in a workflow, um, some of which do get packaged with the open source Bit Curator suite, if you're familiar with that, um, that allow you to generate XML 
that describes the contents of a disk image. So you not only get the checksum of the disk image as a whole itself, but you also get file level checksums um, if you do generate that DF XML. So that's just an important side note there. So as you can see, there's a whole long list of things that you get when you create a forensic disk image that you don't get with the bag. Um, so uh, calling the checksum tamper resistant here is essentially to indicate that with a bag, it's extremely easy to put a file in, take a file out, and just update the bag and update the manifests. Um, if, if you have right access to the bag, it's very simple to do that. Um, and the only thing that would change would be the metadata that says when the bag was saved. Um, so with a disk image, it would be extremely difficult to modify the contents of a disk image um, and do that in a way that was um, not noticeable um, by validation of the checksum. The, um, of course, the disk image itself has the metadata that we showed embedded within it itself. Um, and the disk image contents, it preserves the entire file system. So that is to say, the file system uh, in, in a hard drive or a thumb drive, it contains very important pieces of metadata that we care about in certain settings. Um, the intricacies of the file naming uh, the metadata about when the file was created, when it was modified in terms of dates and timestamps, um, the original order, uh, the kind of like where the files were in the file system, um, and deleted files. These all exist within the metadata of a file system. So when you create a bag, you lose all of that. Potentially, you don't necessarily lose the file name. Um, but suffice it to say that the disk image serves as essentially a, a nice preservation container that makes it so that information is not modifiable and can't be accidentally lost when moving from one storage device to another storage uh, device. So uh, in conclusion, we wanted to kind of leave you with, uh, before we open it up to questions, just some additional thoughts. Um, again, this is a very introductory session. Um, as you begin to think about implementing any kind of disk imaging in your setting, um, there are some things that you are going to want to think about um, carefully before you dive in. Um, so first is ongoing fixity checks. Um, if you are going to rely on the checksums in forensic disk images uh, for fixity, you will want to think about how you're going to do your fixity checks because there aren't uh, exactly off the shelf tools that allow you to simply automate the process of validating these disk images. We showed you a very manual way of doing that. Um, there are absolutely um, existing uh, open source tools available to anybody who's comfortable writing, say, like a Python script uh, to automate the process of doing fixity checks of forensic disk images, but it's not exactly something that's just off the shelf and as easy to use as some of the things we've been showing you today. So that's an important note. Um, it's something that would, re careful, uh, re would require careful consideration. Um, second is automation. Um, if you are going to be doing a lot of disk imaging, thinking about your uh, manual process once it's established and how that's working, thinking about ways you can automate uh, different parts of that, be it uh, image validation or um, any kind of file naming or uploading, there's always opportunity when you're doing something at scale to automate certain steps of that process. Um, and lastly, the most important uh, I would say least technical aspect, but oftentimes the trickiest, is formalizing your policy. And this is where you really decide, um, are you going to make raw or forensic disk images? Um, so the we've really delved into what a forensic disk image includes. So I think the easiest way to explain a raw disk image would be to say, um, and this is confusing for some people because raw is often used, um, say like in a digital photography setting, to um, imply that the thing that is raw is of higher quality. In the case of disk imaging, this is not the case. Uh, a raw disk image is um, essentially the part of the forensic disk image that just contains the files. So the raw image is raw in the sense that it is not wrapped in the metadata and checksums that we've been reviewing. 
Um, so there's a significant trade-off there. You have no ability to verify your fixity or embed any kind of metadata. Um, but there are uh, some settings where certain institutions might decide that they don't like the fact that forensic disk images are a proprietary file format, so they want to create raw images instead. Um, similarly, uh, some institutions for either an access or preservation uh, perspective might decide that they are going to um, not just keep the disk image, but they're also going to export the files from the disk image and save both. Um, and lastly is, of course, how you want to adapt and use the metadata that you have at your disposal when you are creating forensic disk images. So these are things where we really can't provide answers, of course. These are um, very deeply uh, personal and subjective decisions that need to be made at the policy level wherever uh, you happen to be implementing this kind of procedure. Um, and again, the one of the most important aspects, but um, definitely not technical. It's more about what, what feels appropriate from a risk management perspective for your setting. Um, so that concludes the presentation portion of today's webinar. Um, and we will now open up for questions. Um, and I'm going to kick things back over to Rachel and she will uh, moderate your questions as they come in. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, the first question is, shouldn't we write block previous to learning or previous to running checksums? And where uh, does the physical write blocker fit into the workflow? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the physical write blocker, um, let's see if I can kind of circle back to one of my pictures here. So uh, let's let's pretend we were kind of um, let's look at this workstation and pretend we were opening up FTK Imager. Before we'd even done that, um, we would have um, plugged our thumb drive into this little write blocker here in front of the keyboard, um, which has little um, USB. I don't think you can see it in this picture either, but um, just on the right hand side here, it has a little you know USB plug to plug in the thumb drive. So we would plug in the thumb drive. And we would then plug the USB cable into the other side of the write blocker, and that would then be plugged into the computer. And once we've done that, that's the point where we open up FTK Imager and we add the device. Um, so all throughout the entire process, it is write protected. Yes. So that's um, that question is 100% uh, spot on. And I, what was the second part of that question, Rachel? That might have answered it. Okay. Um, but there is a follow-up question also from Stephen. Uh, what is the difference between a write blocker and simply setting the files to chmod111? <laughs> that's 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 an excellent question. Um, so, and I'm the, I'm the sorry. The only reason I'm chuckling is because it's very very um, specific, and I, I I hope I'm not about to get out nerded here. <laughs> Um, so the uh, changing, so the for those who aren't familiar, the um, the second part of that is referring to changing the permissions of a file. Um, so in a file system, there's a piece of metadata that, that says um, who has read, uh, write, and execution abilities on a given file. Um, so these are permissions or settings that are set in the file system itself, not in the file, not in the operating system. So if you were to, uh, say, change that um, on, um, say, the, the drive that we're dealing with in this case, you would actually be modifying um, the the file system contained on that hard drive or thumb drive. Um, and, you know, perhaps there are some settings where that is acceptable, but in most archival settings or museum settings, um, that would be deemed um, an unnecessary modification of the original artifact because um, we can simply ensure uh, right protection and protection against accidental deletion by anybody interacting with it um, by simply um, you know, having this physical device that uh, does the right protection for us. 
Great. Uh, and there is a follow-up, but I'm going to go to the next question, and if there's time after or um, if people would like to stay on, I'll circle back to that. So the next question is, would you prefer this over Bit cur Curator or integrate this into the digital preservation process done with Bit Curator? Gotcha. Um, yeah, so for those who aren't familiar, Bit Curator is a open source suite of digital forensics tools, um, and it came out of um, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I believe it was funded by the Mellon Foundation, uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, but in, in any case, um, yeah, so pretty much everything that we've shown you today, you can do in Bit Curator. Um, the reason we showed you uh, FTK Imager was simply that um, it, it does have generally a more user-friendly interface we've found than um, the tools in BitCurator. Um, you know, BitCurator I think is great if um, you want to place more of an emphasis on um, analysis of the contents of the drive. There's a lot of tools in BitCurator that are um, more for kind of the post-processing of a disk image, running reports about what kinds of files are in it and whatnot. And it does a pretty good job of that. Um, and it's a, it's a free set of tools that can do that. Um, the equivalent tools that do that kind of post-processing analysis um, in the suite of PC-based proprietary tools that we're talking about are very expensive. Um, the tool for creating the disk images that we were showing you isn't, it's free. Um, so um, if you do need to do more uh, forensic analysis, um, for instance, scanning a disk image for social security numbers, um, having a PDF that shows you what file formats are in it, um, and you don't have, um, you know, a large budget for the software to do that, then BitCurator is a fantastic option. Um, but if your institution is a PC environment and you're not doing that kind of analysis, you're just creating the disk images, uh, we've often found FTK Imager to be a great option. But, you know, it's, it's, it's all about whatever you're comfortable with. It's every tool, um, you know, has its place. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, could you explain a bad sector and how to troubleshoot? Mm. In this setting, I don't think I could. Ex <laughs> That's a th that would be a pretty uh, technically complex thing to try and just describe verbally in a couple of minutes. Um, but suffice to, suffice to say that there are tools that will. Um, there are more technical, less user-friendly tools that are more for advanced users um, that will allow you to do um, a, a bit more analysis about uh, bad sectors, a sector being um, a unit of storage on a storage device. Um, DD Rescue is one of those. It's command line based. Um, it's free and open source. Um, it's a great tool. Um, but it, it is, again, a, a little a little less user-friendly. You have to be comfortable with the command line. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's certainly one tool that you could use for troubleshooting uh, bad sectors on a drive. Great. OK, so uh, the next question is, I am wondering about the archives of different formats, how to preserve them from obsolescence, or is it more for saving the media that will be obsolescent? Great question, yeah. So um, disk imaging is really just about stabilizing the unstable media, the physical piece of media, um, and all media is unstable. So that, that refers to everything from a floppy disk to a thumb drive to a hard drive. Um, disk imaging um, does absolutely nothing about file format obsolescence. Um, it's simply, um, you know, the the first step in sort of um, getting started with tending to a born digital archive. Um, now, when it comes to file format obsolescence, um, we, you know, the, the, it's a relatively complex topic that would be difficult, I think, to cover in the next couple of minutes that we have remaining. Um, um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't have a quick, easy answer for that. Um, but you know, of course, there, there, there's ample um, 
you know, tools and reading out there for understanding and, and right. mitigating the risks of file format obsolescence. Um, typically, that is uh, something that would be handled by a digital repository. So you would be, say, perhaps ingesting this these disk images that you're creating into a digital repository, such as Archivematica or Preservica or you know any number of system. I don't want to necessarily throw brand names out there. Um, but the, you know, those systems do tend to be very much focused around the problem of file format obsolescence and conducting file format migration from, say, one format to another for the purpose of preservation. Um, so very surface level answer, but I think that's probably the depth we could take it to. Great. Um, so this is a follow-up. I'm. You may have already answered the, this within your um, last answer, but is disk imaging for hard drives of an artist or can it be for file level preservation? Hmm. Um, that's a, I'm not sure I understand the question completely. Um, if you, I think like maybe let's return to this little table. So if your interest is um, file level preservation, um, I think there's certainly a strong argument still for um, disk images, uh, you know, as we're showing here, the disk image does ensure the um, preservation of many ancillary but important aspects of a file, such as um, the timestamp for when it was created and modified, um, the file name, especially if we're dealing um, with file names that include diacritics and accents. Um, and um, so, yeah, could, could be a, a strong argument for using disk images if uh, our mission is uh, quote unquote file, file level preservation. Um, but yes, of course, the, the, the very clear cut use case for disk imaging is where um, it's, it's more uh, we have this hard drive and that is the thing that we are preserving. So we are taking a complete snapshot of that. Um, in, in our lab, we, you know, when we uh, have clients that we work with where we do actual, you know, uh, processing and intake of their acquisitions of new works of art, we actually do prefer disk imaging even in, in that case, just because we know it's a very, very rudimentary easy process that ensures an extremely high level of preservation and it, it gives us the ability to say well you know in physical storage there's a thumb drive um, and in digital storage there's a disk image of that thumb drive um, so it's a very one-to-one -one, um, kind of thing and um, in our particular environment we have it set up so that we can we can mount those disk images quite easily and, and quickly um, that's not always possible um, but if if it is um, it can alleviate some of the some of the inconveniences that can be created um, through disk imaging. Okay, so this is the last question, and this is the follow up um, to an early one. So this, um, I'll just reread the question and then the second part. So this is when you answered, what is the difference between a write blocker and simply setting the files to CHMOD 111 or simply user win windows files attributes dialog? Sorry, um, could you, I, I think you, you read the, the preamble, but maybe not the question itself. It, well, there was a new follow-up to the, um, it says, uh, I'll just, I'll summarize the two together. What is the difference between a write blocker or simply user, fi or sorry, user file, uh, or user windows files attributes dialog? Okay, sure. I, I think if I'm understanding that correctly, um, it's the same question that was asked before, but just with a, a different um, technical approach. So, so again, um, the difference between the two approaches in, in one, it sounds like you are modifying file permissions, um, which is in fact modifying um, the, uh, the original artifact, um, whereas the write blocker is just a simple, you know, affordable physical device that um, just in, ensures the same thing without uh, making any changes to the original artifact. Um, that being said that, you know, a physical write blocker is not the only option. Um, there are quote unquote software based write blockers. 
Um, generally speaking, um, you know, I I do personally strongly prefer physical right blockers just because there's absolutely zero margin of error um, if it's plugged into the right blocker and that right blocker doesn't have any ability to turn off the right protection then you know there's just simply no way to to, to screw it up okay that looks like it's all the questions uh thank you ben for your informative presentation and thank you very much to everyone for attending today's webinar and introduction to disk imaging again if you'd like to watch any parts of this again the full presentation will be available on the rlis learning portal so again on behalf of ndsr art and small data industries thank you for joining us today <laughs>